Welcome to the Jackie Ray Show. Welcome to the first episode of the Jackie Ray Show. I'm, of course, your host, Jackie Ray. Now, listen, if you subscribe to my old show called At The Half, and you're like, I ain't subscribed to this. Yes, you did. It's the same thing, okay? It's just a revamp. But if you were subscribed to that show, you know it's been about at least a good two, two and a half years since I've done my own show. And to be honest, I really feel like I've lost my voice a little bit and not doing my own thing, which is one of the reasons why I wanted to bring this back. Because we have so many stories that need to be told that don't get the proper attention basically on any media outlet. And in our community, the black community, we have to really share information with one another. Things that happen in your city, it's something similar happening in another city. And if it's drastically different, maybe the things that are happening in your city can help someone else. So we're going to be lighthearted as we start out this process, but eventually there are some very deep topics coming down the line, but I definitely wanted to start things off on a happy note for Black History Month. So I have an amazing guest today. He's someone that I truly look up to. I was on the Mike and Donnie show in 2020 with Mike Hill, and he is going to be on the show today. He shared some nuggets of advice that I think you guys can take home and in your business life and your personal life that I think really mean a lot. We're going to be talking about Nicki Minaj and this Megan Thee Stallion beef, which I'm going to be honest, I don't really understand why it's happening. We're going to talk about that. And of course, we're going to talk some football and his Super Bowl prediction. So I'm not going to hold you too long before we dive into that. But you guys know I work for a lot of different outlets. You know I work with the Long Beach Post, Nightcast Media. I am uh, the host of the Hardwood 94, which covers the WNBA. I am very honored that every Monday I have a regular segment on Later with Mo Kelly with another one of my mentors, the great Mo Kelly himself. So I do a lot. I'm definitely entrenched in the news space. So with that, especially if you've been following me on At The Half before, or if you scroll far enough back on my YouTube page, you will see that one of the things that I always emphasize is if you are black, you have to vote. I have never wavered from that since I first voted when I was 18. I am such a proponent of make sure you vote, especially in your local election, because your local your local politics affect you more so and more immediately than when you're talking about federal federal politics. I'm going to be honest, though, the the more that I've covered politics, the more entrenched I've I've become in the community, the more I've talked to politicians, my viewpoint on that has changed a little bit, especially when it comes to the black community. So if you are new here, let me just tell you my thought process when it comes to voting in the black community, or at least what it was. You need to make sure that you not only have a politician that you endorse because they understand that the needs of the black community are 99.9% of the time different than the needs of other communities. This is one of the things that I've learned, learned, learned as a journalist, and it's been a constant thing from the time I first started right out of college till now, when you specifically call out the needs of black people, people back away. They get very gun shy. And I, to this day, don't know why that is. We can talk about the needs of the LGBTQ community. We can talk about the needs of maybe our disabled community, which I am very happy to see a push forward for that. Um, Cancer patients, anything that you can imagine as far as a community We are very open to saying, hey, what is your needs and how can I help as far as our politics? But when we say, hey, this is what the black community needs, it's like, oh, shoot, I don't don't know, man. Like, does it have to be about the black? Yes, it does. We have very specific needs. So this is why what I'm getting to when I say I've changed my thought process. I've always said, make sure you vote for somebody who is okay with understanding that there is a specific need in our community and make sure that you are prepared to hold them to the fire once they are elected. Because during political seasons, of course, they're going to tell you what you want to hear. It's like that guy that you know is broke, busted, and disgusted and living in his mama's basement. He's going to come in a really nice car. He's going to tell you that he has a very nice place, but he don't want to take you over there because he got roommates. He's going to say all the right things. It's not until you are all hooked and you think, oh my God, he's the one that you realize he's broke, busted, and disgusted. Politicians are the exact same way. They're going to sell you this mountain of gold until they get elected. And then it's going to be like, well, you know, everything's a process. So this is where my narrative has changed. I don't care who you vote for. I don't care if you're a Democrat or Republican. I also don't care if you vote because the longer I have done this, the more that I have realized the biggest asset and the biggest avenue for change in the black community is black people. 
if you cannot get to the point where you can look at your brother and sister on your left and your right and say, hey, what do you need? How can I help? You also need to be able to say, hey, this is what I need. Can you help? Let's go through our communities and let's clean up this graffiti and let's make sure we take blight. There's our, there are studies out that show if there's blight in a community, it increases crime. Let's get our Black-owned businesses to come into our communities because we have garnered a system where they're safe and we could start circulating the Black dollar. If we can't look to ourselves as the answer, it doesn't matter who you vote for. It doesn't matter if you vote. It, we have to see value in ourselves. Everyone else does. Everyone else knows that we're going to spend a whole bunch of money. So they're going to cater specifically black owned products to us and ain't nary a person that, in that business or in those CEOs office black. They see value in how we spend. They see it's that old saying. They love our rhythm, but they don't want any part of our blues. So let's be the rhythm for each other. Remember that this election season, I'm not telling you not to vote. I'm telling you, I don't care if you do. But what I do care about is how you see your brothers and your sisters. We all we got, y'all. Now, with that, I want to take a break real quick and show you a quick clip from when Mike Hill and I first met on the Mike and Donnie show. And then we're going to dive right in with Mike Hill. How do, you, how do you think San Francisco would do with Brady and Garoppolo would do with New England? How the Patriots would do with Garoppolo? Garoppolo would win in New England. Yeah, absolutely. He would win in New England? Yeah, sure. Would Brady, I mean... Damn, the 49ers were a quarter away from winning the Super Bowl. Yeah. Right, you so why would you Tom mess Brady? that up? I mean, no. that's, that's my point, yeah. You don't mess that up. You don't stick Tom Brady into that system. And I know I people say that he's the GOAT, and yes, but he is a, what, 42-year-old GOAT now? GOAT? <laughs> get old. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Billy <laughs> GOAT. So, right. so he's he a Billy GOAT. <laughs> So, welcome back. Once again, you are tapped in with the Jackie Ray Show. This is my first episode once again, so I'm really excited because Mike Hill is joining me right now. He is all things encompassing. He is a TV host, a sports commentator, actor. I feel like he could model if he wanted to, an author, <laughs> all things, and a voice of positivity. If you guys are not following him on Instagram, I highly suggest you do so because I feel like every time I'm going through something, your story pops up with a good word, uh, and I am so appreciative of that. So thank you for joining me. <laughs> thank you for having me. I don't know what I could model, but uh, I just want to be a model <laughs> of consistency. That's pretty much it. That Howard, that Howard hoodie right now. I'm liking that. So uh, thank you. I, I wish I would have gone there. <laughs> I, I didn't go. To, I didn't go to Howard, but I just let people know I, I do represent HU in the fullest because uh, one of my baby mamas went there, and uh, so. Um, it, it does uh, mean a lot to me. So, yeah, thank you for having me, Jack. I really appreciate that. And I'm a big fan of yours as well. Uh, thank you. I appreciate that. Now, you guys, if you don't know, we I met him on a Mike and Donnie show. It was on Fox Soul. Um, and I was so nervous at the time <laughs> because I was like, mm -hmm. because I knew you. And I was like, oh, my God, let me just hold my own. But you guys were so welcoming and you just let me do my thing. And I appreciate you. Now, with the Mike and Donnie show, did it just run its course and you were ready to move on? Or why did that dissolve? Another opportunity came along at that time. And I love doing a Mike and Donnie show because it gave me yeah. something to do outside of what I had been known for. And that's being a sportscaster. I always wanted to host my own talk show. And uh, Fox Soul gave me the opportunity to do that with Mike and Donnie. And I uh, was still good friends with Donnie and all the people over there at Fox Soul. But I got an op another opportunity to be a morning show host uh, at the now defunct Black News Channel, which, you know, we make decisions in our lives. And of course, we know life is a series of choices, but I have no regrets, only uh, uh, life uh, decisions that I've made that became life lessons. And uh, so that's the reason why that went away. But I'm looking forward to the next opportunity where I do have my own talk show. Yeah, me too. I love when you're on air and you do great. I also want to talk about, because I still have, I just wanted to show everybody, I still have my non-autographed <laughs> copy. <laughs> you get it. I got you. Of oh my I got a marker. I need I need an autograph. <laughs> I got you. I got you. But like I said, you're such a voice of positivity. And there was something that, you know, I'm going through things in my journalism career as well. And there was something you said uh, when you went to Dallas. And when you went to mm. Dallas, you felt like you were hired for just being you. And then you got a phone call a little later that says, you know what, you need to tone that down. How do you process that when you feel like you can go into a situation and be your authentic self just to find out that's not the case? Yeah, it's really tough. Um, and at that time, you have to understand the situation I was in because at that time I had gone to Dallas, I was in New York prior to that, and 9-11 happened. And so the show I was on dissolved. It went away, and I was without work for six months. So I'm searching for a job, finally get this opportunity. 
And, you know, you send your resume tape out. So you send your resume tape out. They get to see you. They get to see right. your style. They get to see how you are and how much flavor you have and whatnot. And so I get there and this guy gives me the opportunity to come there. And all of a sudden uh, I'm getting some attention, some good attention. And it's not bobbing with who he is because he's used to getting all the attention. Uh -huh. uh, this is what was sold to me. And then all of a sudden it's like I had to change up because I needed to conform to what he wanted. Now, he was the boss. At the right. end of the day, he's the boss. I got to do what he wants to do because it's his platform. But it's tough because, like you said, you know, you get hired um, to be you and to come to work as your authentic self, especially uh, in this business where it is about, you know, entertaining. It's about informing. It's about enlightening. It's about you being your authentic self because that you, was what you felt like get you uh, that, that job and got to you that far. So when you're told to calm it down, to conform, to be somebody else, and they continue to peel you down, uh, it, it just, you start looking in the mirror one day and you realize, man, I'm not me. And you don't feel comfortable anymore. And you feel like you're lost. Uh, and mm -hmm. that don't, not only happened to me in Dallas, where I actually ended up getting fired because I could never conform to what he wanted me to. I always looked at it and viewed it this way. Um, we may both have been sportscasters, right? So in that realm, we're both fruit, right? But uh -huh. if he's an orange and I'm an apple, no matter how many, how much you peel me down, you can peel me down to my core. I will never taste like an orange. I'm still going to bring my own deliciousness, my own fruit, my own flavor or whatnot. I'm still going to be a fruit or whatever. But at the same time, I'll never taste like you. And he wanted me to become an orange instead of like, you know, uh, being something that I was. So uh, that, that hurt. And then it even got worse when I was at ESPN, where I completely lost my identity. Uh, and it took me a while to get back. So when you're going through something like that, to answer your question, I feel like you just have to make a decision. You have to basically come in, let people know exactly who you are, even if they've seen you on tape. Uh, find out what they want from you from the beginning. What do you want me and what do you need me to bring to the table because you bring a certain set of skills that got you that job? Why did they hire you? Even in the uh, um, the, the, the interview process, you can ask those questions. I, mean, you know, I think we go to an interview process trying to get the job so much that we don't ask the right questions to make sure that it's the right job for us. Get right. it? You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. So mm -hmm. if you if it's not the right job for you and they want you to be somebody that you feel like you're not, you have to make a decision on whether you want to take that job or not. Uh, and now that's just something that I've learned over the years. So, uh, but now you just kind of go in and if you go out, you got to go out on your own sword and you fall down on your own sword and just be yourself. Be sure to let them know exactly who you are. Be sure to know exactly what they expect from you and basically have that, hey, it's written down. This is what happened. So when they pull you into the office six months later, like, hey, we talked about this. What has changed? And they have to explain themselves. It's tough. It's, we're, we're always going to have to navigate because we know they always move the goalposts no matter right. what we do. We, we can come in and we can have the, the, the greatest following in the world or whatnot. But at the same time, if it's not the following that they want or pushback from the side that they want to hear from or they need to hear from or they feel like as the biggest voice, then um, it's going to be a problem for us. But we're going yeah. to, we, got, we have to continue to fight. Amen. I love that. I want to yep. dive into some entertainment news. This is just fun for me because mm. I'm not I used to be a big Nicki Minaj fan, but. After mm. Pink Friday, I kind of fell off because she just wasn't vibing with my spirit anymore. Um, okay. But then I see, you know, Megan Thee Stallion, I appreciate her flow. Still not the type of music that I would listen to. So I'm kind of tapped out as far as the women in hip hop right now. That's a whole nother story for another day. But mm -hmm. the women in hip hop right now just ain't doing it for me. I remember when I look not to tell my age, but Queen Latifah <laughs> was telling us not to let people call us the B word. And now we just yeah. winging it around at will. <laughs> and so I'm, just, mm -hmm. I'm just not there with the, the female rappers. But. I did see that there was a beef between the two of them. And then, I, of course, I went down that rabbit hole. And I probably have a question that's a little bit different than what a lot of people are questioning. Because a lot of people are dragging Nikki for her, I guess, diss track against uh, Megan Thee Stallion, which was terrible. But so I started mm -hmm. to read a little bit more about Nikki. And, of course, I knew that she was 10 toes down with her brother when he was charged with that sexual assault on a minor. What I didn't really realize was that her husband is also the same. Like her husband can't even go to a school. She had done a mm -hmm. lap dance on a 13 year old and a show and she was booed for that. She also has a song with a 16 year old. She was 27 at the time where she was talking about taking him behind the bleachers and doing, you know, sexually explicit things to him. Of course she did a song with Takashi six, nine, and he is also pled guilty to sexual assault on a child. So 
In this cancel culture world, how is Nikki dodging this? I don't think she is, to be honest with you. I just think that she has a fan base that's so huge that they, you know, no matter what, Takashi 6 9 still has a fan base. You know, no matter what, Puffy still has a fan base. There are people out here that still love R. Kelly. And he still has a fan base. So I think if you have a fan base that is that huge, that is, you know, that follows, that has a swelling, she has a, what do they call them? The, the, the What do they call her? Her fan base. Is what it is the that? Barbies? The Barbies. Yeah, the Barbies. The bar- okay. And you got some, <laughs> yes, the Barbs. The Barbs. You the got barbs, the Barbs okay. that follow you and no matter what you do and look at you and you can do no wrong, you know what? You're never going to be out of style or irrelevant to them. So they will carry you along the way. Now, see, you sure. said in the beginning that you were kind of rocking with Nikki before with the music. And then after uh-huh. a while, the music fell off and you became kind of like, OK, well, I can take her or leave her or whatnot. And then there are other people that just didn't like her from the beginning because they either didn't like her music or didn't like her attitude. I'm that person who's like, OK, I like her, her her music. I'll listen to some of her music, some of her tracks. I can take some. I can give some back. And then there are parts of me that's like, I just don't like her as a person because I feel like she's right. like a bully and she's kind of mean, even before all these other allegations and other things that kind of came to light. But. If you look at the history of what cancelization is about, there has to be a huge majority of people who are in that category, who are either somebody who was on the fence, who was swayed okay. by something that happened that pushed them to the other side, or the people that didn't like her, and they overwhelmingly take over her fan base. Right now, I think it's still about 50-50. The thing with Nicki Minaj is, yeah, you'll lose endorsement deals, but how many right. endorsement deals does she have that's really mainstream or whatnot? If you were to cancel Megan Thee Stallion right now, you wouldn't see her on a Planet Fitness ad. You just wouldn't. Mm-hmm. You wouldn't see uh, Tiger Woods got canceled for a second at one time. He lost a lot of endorsement deals. Yep. But you still have a fan base that is still huge enough that will rock with you no matter what, that it doesn't have that big of an effect on you. Now, it will hurt you somewhat, but it doesn't have that effect where you will actually, actually be absolutely canceled. Look at the people who've been canceled are the ones who don't mm-hmm. have that huge fan base um, may have had a big body of work, but they was most people were on the fence or people who didn't care for them anyway or didn't even know who they were. And now they're overwhelmingly saying basically things about, I will never support this person. They're horrible. They're trash. It took 20 years, 20 years in R. Kelly going to jail because people heard about and those tapes 20 years ago and people knew. And it took, but because mm-hmm. he, uh, because he, he brought out, uh, in the closet, uh, volumes one through twenty-five, people were still rocking with R. Kelly because the music was relevant, because he had good music or whatever. And people, you know, and I'm not bringing Michael Jackson up, but people still say the same thing about Michael Jackson. So it, mm-hmm. it, it's hard to say why people get canceled and why other people don't get canceled, or whatever. But uh, in my opinion, I just feel like if you got that fan base that rocks with you no matter what, uh, what what's been said uh, outside of your music or your personal life, they don't give a damn about it. But I think she has been, yeah. in a sense, canceled. And she's been canceled with me and you for a long period of time. It just kind of just adds to what you already knew about her. And like I said, um, the music isn't that great for me that I'm going to like rock with her or defend her. Right. So I'm not going to go yeah. on a tangent because you brought up R. Kelly. And I have this debate all mm-hmm. the time. Can you think that R. Kelly needs to rot away in prison but still want to step in the name of love? Or do you have to just not want to rock with him at all? I think I could still enjoy somebody's art uh, because it wasn't just him with the art. I mean, I don't think he composed all the music. I don't know if he wrote all the right. lyrics or whatever. Sometimes it's just a vo- voice. Uh, will, uh, will R. Kelly come on and I turn it off? Do I feel a little bit funny about it? Especially when I hear about certain lyrics. When I hear mm. um, when I hear Aaliyah, uh, age ain't nothing but a number. And I know R. Kelly wrote it. Yeah, I mean, that, that brings some. I, I won't listen to that because I, I know right. where it came from. You know what I mean? But if I'm if I hear I believe I can fly, yeah, I'm still I love that song. I will still love that song. Sometimes it's not about who's delivering the message, but the message itself okay. that matters to me. And I say that all the time because somebody even brought it up. Somebody wanted me to cancel Steve Harvey because he stole a joke from from uh, Mark Curry or whatever. <laughs> and there was these, you know, and you're talking about inspirational speakings and, and sayings. Steve will say something inspirational. I had it on my 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 uh, Instagram. And it's like, oh, you can't listen to Steve Harvey. Listen to uh, it. It's not, I'm like, it's not mm. about who's saying it. It's about the message that's behind it or whatever sometimes, you know. And I, I get yeah. it. it. There's a factor that's involved. 
But at the same time, man, I, I can go a little bit deeper and look past, you know, the person in their, uh, their, their, their issues sometimes, because I think we're all flawed in some way or another. You just don't know about everyone's flaws. Very true. Now, I haven't made it out to one of your comedy shows yet, but how did your real, I know you always wanted to be an actor and you've done that, but then how did you get into this comedy space? Uh, I got a lot of friends who are uh, comics, uh, comedians. Uh, My cousin is one, he's D.L. Hughley, but most of my uh, friends out here, like 50% of them are like comics, right? And I've always wanted to like kind of do something different. Everybody sees me kind of button up. You know, like yeah. light skinned dude in the shoot and tie <laughs> and real, real kind of professional and code switching every now and then so I can enunciate and I can actually, you can hear the words that are coming out of my mouth and I can sound like that sometimes, whatever. But at the same time, like the real Mike Hill, the people, the person that I can, like and he was talking about that conforming. I have to mm-hmm. do that for television because I can't go out there and be my true self. I can't go out there and say, hey man, you know what happened today in sports? Keep, man, dog. Man, I, I would <laughs> never even get a job there. I can't do that. But so, right. you know, but on stage, I really feel like I can let my little hair that I got, I can let it down and I can truly be myself. So I've gone on a podcast or two on comedians podcasts who know me because they know me behind the scenes. And they're like, man, you're funny. You know, what, what, you ever tried to stand up? And obviously there is that that trepidation because going on stage is another thing. You can say you can right. tell jokes around the house when you're drunk or high or whatever. But when you're on, I did say I'm high. I just said I get high. Like I, people know, well, I'm in L.A. I'm in LA. It's legal here. It's I legal. Care. I don't worry about it. And it's it relaxing. Is legal. I'm a, and God put and I'm a grown for me man. Too. Yeah. For me and you. For me, me and you. I do the gummies. <laughs> I don't smoke. I got asthma. And I got allergies, so I okay, can't do it. See? But, but, but the thing is, it's like so. I've gone on podcasts, and he's like, "Let's try." So I went and I did this one podcast, and there's a lady named Nikki Pam uh-huh. who told uh, this comedian named Hope Flood that, "Hey, you know, he's always thought about comedy. Why don't you have him host the show?" Hope calls me up, says, hey, I got the show. I want you to come host. And I did it, and I fell in love, and it's been an addiction. It's been a drug, and it has actually helped me because the last two years of my life, Jackie, have been the the hardest two years of my life. And going on that stage and being able to actually use that as part of my therapy, to go up there and speak my truth but try and say it in a funny manner or whatnot, it has been been life-saving for me. It's been great. So I'm enjoying the ride. So when you say it's been hard, I know, I feel like our society is just kind of prone. We're almost immune to the breakups now. Like we just kind of expect it. But I know some of us, like I'm a hopeless romantic, but I'm also Mm. Tom Brady retired from dating. Yeah. My last relationship took it all out of me. And I'm like, y'all can have that. I'm going to let y'all have that space. Mm -hmm. But it's weird Mm -hmm. for me because I still believe in love and I still, you know, in my heart would want to find love. But at the same time, I don't want to step out. Because I'm like, I cannot go through that again. So it's just, I'm in this very, very weird space. Um, so I think that it helps that I'm a workaholic so I can kind of dive mm. into stuff like that. But when you say you've had a hard two years, is some of that kind of the love loss or the, are you still a hopeless romantic? Do you still see that happening for you in the future? Uh Yes and no. Uh, I am. I am still. I don't, I don't know if I've ever been a hopeless romantic. I've just been somebody that's lived my life mm. and somebody that when I'm around, I want to be happy and I want the person that I'm with to be happy. And I want you to already bring happiness to the table so I don't have to actually necessarily give it to you that right. you need it. Right. I want to add to your happiness and I want you to add to my happiness. But if you're not happy already, I can't make you happy. 100%, and I think that's yeah. the problem that we have sometimes. Um so, yeah, I mean, losing, you know, a marriage that was very public and the fallout and the misinformation that was out there about it and all that type of stuff like that it was kind of tough to defend, especially at the same time I'm going through. I was going through a lot of professional issues. Uh, I told you, like BNC folded or whatever. So the same year that BNC folded, I'm out of a job looking for work or whatever. I'm going through this public breakup and then the public breakup. You're concerned that that's going to affect you professionally because it was so public and a lot of lies being out there. So it was tough, man. And then just your name alone, man. So I, I worked hard to build this name up. And, you know, I thought I, you know, I've I not pretended to be anybody except myself. The years ago that I put on mask every now and then to hide who I truly was when it came to weed smoke and all that type of stuff like that. Yeah. Who hasn't? But I was I've never considered myself a bad person. But, you know, there's that perception that could be out there. And then you're paranoid because like, OK, well, is that out there because people are saying this? Is that affecting me when it comes to me getting jobs or whatnot? So all that stuff has been tough. And then, you know, losing a couple of people to, to death, you know, four people that were really close to me in that same year, 
it's been really tough and it's still tough, but I deal with it the best way I know how. And I have faith because I've gone through stuff like that before. It's not crumbling me. It's not making me uh, uh, overly concerned. Uh, do I have anxiety every now and then? Absolutely. But at the same time, because I've gone through so much in my life, I can look back and see scars that I've gone through and realize that, hey, I've been here before. I can see the reminder of that scar, but I also know that scar makes me have tougher skin and I can get past it. So, uh, yeah, it, it's been tough. But I, I will I will say this to you and to Hopeless Romantics and the people out there. Don't ever give up. Maybe you don't have to look for it, but always be open to it, because just like you love anything, you love your job, you love what you go through. You go through a lot of what you've gone through. And I know part of your story about, you know, you, you're, you're great at what you do. Thank uh, you. you give a hundred thousand percent. And so when the other person, your job, your managers don't give you the things that you put in. It doesn't mean that you got to stop. You know, it doesn't mean that you need to have a romantic relationship. Sometimes people don't need to have a job or whatnot, but you want to have a job. Of course, you need the money and all that type of stuff that goes along with it. But be open to receiving it if it comes along, not necessarily looking for it or being desperate to find it. Because you can still be a, not be hopeless romantic, just be a romantic and just have hope that one day, the right person will come into your life because um, do I want to get married again? Nah, I've been yeah. there before. I've done that three times. I got the experience. I, I I say this all the time. Like I was in a wedding. I was at a wedding uh, a couple of months ago with a good friend. And it was like, man, why don't you uh, try and catch that garter? And I was like, man, I would rather catch. I would rather have pneumonia with one lung and catch <laughs> COVID. Damn. Than catch that garter. Yeah. <laughs> That's how I felt at that particular time. But <laughs> if I'm not, so I'm not, what I'm saying is I'm not going to go over there to catch the garter. But if uh -huh. the garter comes and it lands in my hands and it's the right person, if that's what God wants, then that's what I'm going to take. That's so, I used to be, okay, this is a random fact about me. I used to be a wedding singer and that kind of <laughs> uh, tainted my, because, and it wasn't that the weddings weren't beautiful, but I'm frugal. That, that's just how I was born, mm. right? So I'm calculating all the money that's being spent. I'm like, do y'all know what y'all could do with this money? This is just yes. one day. And it just yes. was like, ah, this is not for me. <laughs> yep. And, and you know, it's crazy to that point. Like when I got married, when I was, when I was married to Cynthia and we got, it was such a big grand affair. And I remember it was during COVID and I was already concerned about that. And people were already making this like, she wanted this big wedding. And I'm like, yo, I'm like, I've been married a couple of times. I know you've been married before, whatever I said, you know, but she wanted to keep the date. And I'm like, we, it's COVID. It's in the middle. I'm not trying to dump on her or put anything on her or whatnot. So please, I don't want anybody to take this the wrong way. And please back me up if somebody takes a clip of this jacket Absolutely. and let people know this, the whole thing of what I'm saying. <laughs> I'm not putting it on her. But people saw it. People actually saw it play out on the reality show mm -hmm. where I said, look, you know what? We can still have the date, but we don't have to have all those people there. We don't have to spend all this money. I said, I want a marriage. I don't want the wedding as much as I want the marriage. Exactly. And the, when the wedding overshadows the marriage and your marriage is already in trouble and it became too much of a show. I don't know if it was before the cameras or whatever and all that type of stuff like that, but it, it just, it didn't sit well with me ever sit well with me. And I, so I always tell people, man, you ain't got to spend all that money, 300,000, 500,000 people who spend a million dollars on a wedding, put that money into an annuity or an investment or yes. whatever while you are in your marriage and watch it grow. So y'all can have something to fight over when you get a divorce. Exactly. <laughs> Not still be paying off the damn wedding yeah. bills. That's yeah. crazy. And no, right, <laughs> right, right. Yeah. No, so we would have put that money. And, we, and so me and, me and Cynthia had a really good, very cordial divorce, but if yeah. we would have put that money that we spent into that wedding into some kind of investment, then we would have had something to fight over. Yeah, and that would have been all right. <laughs> when we got a divorce. Money. <laughs> it would have been money, exactly. <laughs> yes, all right, now let's dive into your wheelhouse because uh, Mike Tomlin mm -hmm. is just one of my favorite people. I, I've never met him in person, but I just, I love the, how steadfast he is and he's a fixture, he, especially as far as black coaches go. He's been a fixture and a, a prominent fixture for a long time, but now he's in the last year of his contract. And of course, mm. the Steelers haven't won, I think, since 2016 in the playoffs. So now, of course, mm. it's like, okay, is he going to come back? What do you think happens for him going forward? Oh, I, th I think he's the Pittsburgh Steelers coach as long as he wants to. I mean, Steelers, okay. first of all, they don't fire coaches. I mean, they've had they don't. What, three coaches since the 70s, you know, from Chuck Noll to Coward to, to now uh, Tomlin. So, I mean, it, it, <laughs> how messed up would it be if the Steelers fired <laughs> they fired Mike Tomlin <laughs> when they have implemented the Rooney rule when it comes to black right. coaches and whatnot 
And Mike Tomlin is a future Hall of Fame coach. And if you look at surveys of NFL players and ask them the coaches they would want to play under any, even general managers saying who's the most hireable, who's the best coaches in the NFL, year in and year out, Mike Tomlin is one of the top 5% coaches uh, out there. So he, um, Mike Tomlin is a great coach. He's got to put the right people around him. I think Mike Tomlin did the right thing by finally, because they don't even fire coordinators. He finally fired his coordinator uh, in the middle of the season. And, you know, he's got to have the right personnel. They got to find a quarterback first, you know, and find a good quarterback. I mean, think about that. He had Ben Roethlisberger for the most of his his career, who's going to be a future Hall of Fame quarterback or whatnot. Uh, and, you know, same thing. Look at Bill Belichick. Bill Belichick, the majority of his career in New England, had a Hall of Fame quarterback who was the greatest quarterback of all time. And now Bill Belichick's without a job. So uh, with Mike Tomlin, when it comes to the Pittsburgh Steelers, because of the team he's with, I'll add that to it. I think Mike Tomlin will get the, the contract, the extension that he deserves, that he needs, and hopefully the players that will help him turn that franchise around. Mm -hmm. I hope so. I just love seeing him on the sideline. It just speaks to my heart. Um, Lamar Jackson, though, is one of my favorite quarterbacks. He's always – people are always criticizing him. They're always saying he's the reason why. I don't think he's the reason why – the Ravens did not win and get to the Super Bowl. Do you, who, where's the blame? Or can we spread it around? Or where's the blame in that situation? Uh, uh, here, here's the thing. What I will say about Lamar Jackson is he's an elite quarterback. Lamar Jackson right. is going to win his second MVP, right? Lamar Jackson is a top five quarterback in his league. And I say, if you're in the top four, top five, you're an elite quarterback because there aren't that many great quarterbacks out there. You're the greatest of the great. Mm -hmm. However, Lamar Jackson deserves a lot of the blame for them not getting as far as they went. Lamar Jackson so? in that yes no the fact that they got as far as they got Lamar Jackson deserves the majority of the credit and then that defense as well don't get me wrong but when it came time for Lamar Jackson to step up in the biggest game of his career he did not step up he did not show up and as much as I love Lamar I can still spank my own even though I love my kids I still spank and I'll tell you when you're wrong I'm not gonna tell you yeah. what you want to hear I'm gonna tell you what you need to hear because I want you to get better I want Lamar Jackson to get better I think Lamar Jackson and not just for himself, but for our culture. I hope he gets better because, you know, we get labeled a certain way because he's a running quarterback. He's not that typical, prototypical. He's not quarterback -y, as somebody would say or whatnot, uh, but he's a good quarterback. And I, I want him to succeed. I need him to succeed. I think we as a culture need him to succeed. His team needs him to succeed. But in that game, uh, in the, uh, in the uh, AFC Championship game, when he needed to step up at home, he did not. He had the worst game of his of his in my in my estimation his of the season and because of the stakes that was at hand of his career. He did not do what he needed to do at that moment. So how much of the, the blame does he deserve? He deserves a lot of the blame because he did not do what Lamar Jackson had done all season that makes him the MVP of the league. And you know, it, it, timing does play a factor in how you get blamed or how you get looked at. Same thing with Dak Prescott. Same thing with Josh Allen. Same thing with all these other quarterbacks out there. Your job right now is not to be great. Your job is to be elite. When you're elite, you put your team on your shoulders and you carry them further than they've ever gone before and you help them to exceed expectations. And Lamar Jackson didn't do that in the, in the, in the game in which he needed to. All right, so now let's go into the Super Bowl, which is definitely, I'm calling it the elite Super Bowl, because if you ain't got a whole bunch of money, you ain't going. Them tickets is like $5,000 for the nosebleed. But mm -hmm. I, I, I hate that. But who you got winning in the Super Bowl? Well, I'm a little disappointed in the teams that are going to the Super Bowl. Not Me that too. I have anything against those fan bases, but I just I wanted to see a Cognac Super Bowl. I wanted to see a Hennessy yes. Super Bowl with <laughs> Detroit and Baltimore. I just wanted to see the blackest Super Bowl. I wanted Vegas to be so black. I wanted to see stretch Cadillacs. I wanted to see gators and fur coats coming down the Las Vegas Boulevard, man. The strip. Yes. I just, I just, I wanted to see, you talking about like, oh, it was, oh, it's gonna be, uh. But anyway, I digress. Um, no, that's on point. <laughs> I, how can I, how can I look at a Super Bowl with Patrick Mahomes in and Andy Reid in Kansas City and not feel like they're the team to beat, even right. though. Even though San Francisco has all the horses and they got all, they got a great team. They have a better team, but Kansas City has that experience. And I know they played four years ago in the Super Bowl or whatever. Brock Purdy wasn't in the Super Bowl then. Exactly. And I, he's lived up. He's done his one. He's, this is his first Super Bowl. It's a different animal. Christian McCaffrey didn't play in that Super Bowl back then. You know what right, I mean? Yeah. Uh, so it's like some of your stars, your bigger stars, didn't play in that Super Bowl. So now that you're in that game, the hype. 
And we know uh, everything that leads up to that Super Bowl, the media attention, being asked those questions just the two weeks off to think about it, your family members or whatnot. I mean, I, Patrick Mahomes can deal with distractions. His dad just got arrested for the UI. No. So there's a... So, so you can deal with it. some people can deal with some of those distractions because okay, well, been there, done that. I can insulate myself. But and when it's somebody like the 49ers and newer, you know, people in there and it's their first experience or whatever, uh, it could be a little bit different. So I, I will have to say I'm going with Kansas City to win it. Uh -huh. uh, I will be happy if San Francisco does because I like to see other teams get you know some glory sometimes too. But uh, I think that will solidify Kansas City as the dynasty that we have. Uh, at the current time, they've taken over the reins from the old New England Patriots right. and become that dynasty for us uh, going into the 2020s and, and beyond. Yeah, I'm same. Like I, Patrick Mahomes, you cannot you cannot sleep on his talent. The man is immensely talented. Andy Reid, I love him to death. I, for selfish reasons though, just want the 49ers to go in there and wreck shop because that means that's one less time that the camera will go to Taylor Swift. <laughs> and that's no, all they, I want. No, they, no. Here's the thing. <laughs> Here's the thing. Now, it, there will be a lot of cutaways to Taylor Swift. You just won't see her happy oh, okay. in San Francisco. They, oh, please believe this. Believe they, they already know they, they're going to cut away to Taylor Swift. I, I, I wish there was like something in Vegas, and I don't think they could put it out there in a lot of the sports books because mm -hmm. that could be controlled by the producer. The producer could have some money on the game or whatever. The over-under of cutaways of Taylor Swift during the Super Bowl, oh. I say it's got to be, I would set it at seven. Seven. Oh, You're going to see at one. least seven cutaways of Taylor Swift and Brittany Mahomes and the rest of that crew swag, uh, lag surfing, whatever they're trying yeah, to do. Yeah, because I don't know what that was. <laughs> yeah, I have no idea what that was Um, in the Super Bowl. So, yeah, but so even if they're not doing it, if, if Kelsey's not catching the ball or, or Mahomes and Niners are winning or whatever, they're still going to find their cutaways and they're going to find that little – because Taylor's – her, her Daryl look, is probably more popular yeah. than her happy look. Yeah, Think I can't about even it. do it right. Yeah, yep. you're right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like she just like this blank white Bye. face. You know, nothing against white people. Don't get me wrong. But there's this blank, this blank nothingness. Just nothing. Like, nothing. It, yeah. <laughs> it's lifeless. Lifeless. And even when they went to her last Super Bowl and they and she looked up at the camera and she saw him like, go away. Go away. Yeah. You know, go, like, you know, yeah. So they're they're going to find her. No matter what's going yeah. on in the game, they will definitely make that part of the aspect. During the uh, halftime show, I guarantee they're going to try and find Taylor Swift taking away time from Usher. Some kind of way. I don't know. They will find now listen, some. You want to see black women in this country act a whole fool? Take the camera off Usher and put it on Taylor Swift. Ooh. <laughs> Best of, the fact that they were even asking if she was going to be a part of the halftime show. First of all, she's barely yeah. going to get back herself, so she won't be able to rehearse and all that type mm -hmm. of stuff. And so I know she's not going to be there. But here's the thing. Even with Taylor Swift, and I know I can joke about Taylor, but I ain't mad, man. To be honest with you, I, I know a lot of people upset with it, but Taylor, if I defend her playing devil's advocate, she's not asking for the attention. Does she right. love the attention? Probably so. Does she know it brings and generates more money in her pocket and the NFL is generating money? Absolutely. They're business people. But at the end of the day, if somebody wants to give you attention and put more money in your pocket and even more popularity or whatnot, what are you going to tell them? Stop right. doing it. People just don't. So I, 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 I hope that we can get to the point where we can say, hey, you know what? If it's not in that person's control. Just let yeah. them live. Like the whole Travis Kelsey, Taylor Swift, is it fake? Is I don't give a damn if it's fake or not, man. Like if they're happy and they tell each other they love each other, that's fine. Okay. I just don't want the little girl to break up with the boy because if she breaks up with him, she going to hit him with a revenge song that's more malicious than any hit he's huh? ever taken from a linebacker. We know that. We she know that. Her revenge he songs are the only ones I like. <laughs> yes. You 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 think you think like uh, you think a linebacker is going to end Travis Kelsey's career? It would be right. that hit song. He it would be that malicious sure. revenge. Song. He would he gonna cry in the car on the <laughs> field. So that's the thing. That's the that's the the, the 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 scary part about Travis Kelsey gaining all the notoriety and all this attention or whatnot is if it goes south, mm. he's gonna get the opposite. End. Believe me, I've been in it. I've been there. I'm like, you know, like I was married to a housewife. You know what I'm right, saying? Right, so right. like, even though, even, even though I, I had some popularity being on television before, it's a mm -hmm. different audience, different crowd that sees you or whatever. And then when things go sour, guess what? Those people, a lot of those people turn on you. Yeah. And they become like, I'm telling you, man, I, I always say, man, being 
married to a housewife is like a piece of luggage, man. It's like, you know, you're going to get to go places every now and then, but your whole job, your whole persona is to be abused and dragged. Mm. I mean, that is your purpose. That is your purpose to be on that show as a man on The Real Housewives of Atlanta or any of these shows to be abused and dragged. It's, it's true. Look yeah. at any of the men that's on the show. Yeah, 100%. Think about it. 100%. Think, think about mm-hmm. it. So anyway, anyway. That's, Mike, that's it's been so I'm good talking to you. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> That's what that comedy is for, right? And your new podcast. Mm-hmm. What Your podcast is Done There, Been That, Done, right? Done There, Been That. I do it with uh, Eunice Elliott. Uh, we take sports topics and we do like Travis Kelsey and, and, and Taylor Swift. We'll probably talk about Travis Kelsey and how they've all of a sudden made Travis Kelsey's hairstyle. Uh, this new hairstyle that's out there that we've been rocking for years called the fade. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> so we we'll talk about things the, like that. We should call it the Kelsey appropriation. That sounds like a good name uh, yeah, for well, that. Well, uh, the swags, the, the whatever the lag surf was, what? the Taylor Swift dance appropriation. Right. Now, who is this new sensation they're doing? They're swaying back and forth. I'm like, eh, look, we, we know. But once again, here, let's go back in full circle. This is why we need voices like you. Uh, at these papers and these newsrooms, whatnot, and doing what you're doing because we need your voice. We don't need your face. You have a beautiful face, but your voice is just as important as your face because you're going there and you're going to speak up. You're going to use your platform for what's right and be able to speak up and say, hey, you know, we're not putting the headline out. That's not, uh-huh. you, you want to piss a lot of black people off? Go ahead. Now, some people will do it anyway because they want to get that attention or whatever. Right. But at the same time, you don't have to be a part of that. And you have to speak up when you need to speak up on these situations. You can't fight every fight because you don't want to be labeled as the the, the problem child or whatever. You're not going to change mm-hmm. everything. But certain things, this is the reason why diversity matters inside the boardrooms and the newsrooms and not just in front of the camera or the people that are writing the stories. We need them behind the scenes and the decision makers that are doing these things. Ooh, now, listen, I'm not going to tell you all all my personal business, but when I tell you Mike Hill spoke directly into my spirit, but he always does. So if you need a word, he always has a good one. Make sure you're following him on Instagram at it's Mike Hill. I'm going to put that link in the description. He's just a great person to follow. He has a lot of life history. He's been through a lot of things that can resonate with a lot of us. So please make sure you follow him. Please make sure you subscribe to this podcast. Give it five stars so we can continue to rise. Now, if you're not following me on YouTube, and if you're listening to this and you want to see this podcast, make sure you're following me on YouTube at Jackie Ray TV and on all things social media at Jackie Ray TV. I'm so glad that you joined me in this very first episode of the Jackie Ray Show. And remember, life is short, so make it good. Mm-hmm.